everyone to the table. We are so delighted to see you guys. Thank you for joining us and participating in this online Bible study. It is thrilling our hearts to see what the Lord is doing as he is gathering the remnant and breathing on his bride because that's what's happening in this time. And we're gathering online to fellowship over the word of God and to fill our lamps with oil, to get bread for our daily journey. And if this is your first time here, we're glad that you've joined us. Um, we are all reading the Bible together over the course of a year, cover to co cover to cover. It's a chronological reading plan and it can be found on the website at tourofTruth.com. Um, it can also be found on a Bible app. If you like to read the Bible that way, that's also on the homepage. You can download it there. So we come together on these Monday nights, every Monday at 730, um, to fellowship around the Word of God. We meet with brothers and sisters from many different places in the world. We're praying that the Lord will just continue to keep adding to our number, just as he did with the early church. We're discussing um, what we've read through the week. We're talking about these things um, and speaking about what is the Holy Spirit saying to us as we're reading the scriptures. And I want to highlight that these meetings are participatory. So we want to encourage you to share, um, you know, yourself with us and all of us, what the Holy Spirit may be saying to you. You know, we learn through one another and, and the Lord uses each one of us. No one is insignificant in what the Spirit might be speaking. And we can all um, glean from one another in that way, just like the early church did when they fellowshiped together. And so we are wanting the Lord to be our guide because he's truly the head of the church. It's what he told us in his word. So we're depending upon the Holy Spirit. My name is Krista Smith, and I am one of the facilitators at Tour of Truth, um, along with Pastor Jed Robine, who will be hosting tonight's meeting, and Pastor Sylvia Laughlin, who will be hosting next week's meeting. Um, but another thing I want to clarify really quickly is that as facilitators, None of us claim to have all of the answers. We don't, but we know the one who does. And so we want to invite him now into this meeting, into this holy convocation and invite him to fill the atmosphere, to fill our minds, to prepare our hearts, to receive um, from his word and to receive from his body as we fellowship together over the word. Pastor Sylvia, can I invite you to pray for us before we begin? Absolutely. Amen. Again, welcome everyone. And I want to welcome you into the throne room. Amen. The Bible clearly tells us it is the place that we are to come so that we can receive the mercy and the grace. We can obtain it for when we need it. And I love that because God is telling us in advance because he knows everything we're going to need it. So let's partake of the offerings that he has for us. Amen. And it begins by you. I don't know what you've been through today. I truly don't. But God does. And with that, letting it all go by intentionally focusing on he is the Lord. Can you just begin to meditate on he is the Lord, that he is God, can you just know that whatever it is, he is the creator of the universe, that he indeed is the one that made all things, that everything is in his control. Can you, I want you to understand that he's majesty. See, it's not the president, it's not a prime minister, but majesty, the king of all kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe, the one and only has invited us to come in and let's just go in realizing that he is majesty, that he and he alone is God, that only he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Can you begin to just stand in awe of him as you begin to see that the king, the king has his eyes on little old you and little old me and that he is delighting in what comes out of your mouth. He is delighting in every thought. He is God. 
he is God. Can begin to tell him how great he is, how magnificent he is, and how holy and righteous he truly is. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come just to delight in you. We come to acknowledge that you are majesty, that you are holy, that you are God forever and ever. You are the Lord forever and ever. You are worthy of our praise forever and ever. You are worthy of our admiration. And tonight we come to say we appreciate you. We thank you. We are forever grateful. Glory and honor. It is yours. We come to bring you the fruit of our lips as our lips exalt you and lift you up, Lord Jesus. Reminding ourselves that you said if you be lifted up, you will draw men unto you. That you are the same God that created the mountains, the trees, all the mountains bow before you. The earth, hallelujah, declares that you are God. The trees clap their branches in praising you. Every star that glimmers, glimmers in recognizing that you are God, you are God, you are God. God, and we too come and say, have your way on tonight. Whatever it is you choose to do, you do it because we are here to acknowledge you and to delight in your presence. And you are the Lord our God, all knowing, all doing. Come, we open up our hearts to receive from you so that your word. You can cause it, Lord God, to grow root so deeply in us that the enemy will not be able to snatch it. For you forewarned us that if we receive a word and we do not understand it, the enemy will take it from us. Let it not be so on tonight because we understand that you are the one that's teaching, leading, guiding us every step of the way. And it begins by us acknowledging that the king of glory, the king of glory in whom you are is in our midst. And we give you praise in Jesus name. Amen and amen. 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 Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so we will turn it all, all over to Jed to let him begin to introduce himself and uh, start leading us in tonight's discussion. Amen. And thank you. So good to be with everybody. Thank you, Sylvia, for that prayer. Amen. <laughs> She can uh, pray you pray, pray sister. Down, right? <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, all right, well, we're going to dive into the word. Um, so just because this is our second meeting, just so everyone gets familiar with kind of the structure, the facilitator will take 10 to 15 minutes and kind of create a sandbox that they've prepared for us to kind of start our discussion in that we, we're all praying about, Lord, what's, what are you, what are you saying to us personally? And we'll kind of create a little space, ask a few questions to get the conversation rolling. And so uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts, reflections that the Lord's given me. Um, and then I'll ask a few questions. And then once we're in, in Q and a time, just want to encourage everybody, uh, raise your hand. We will see it. We'll call on you by name. Um, if you have something that that's in your heart, that's percolating, we'll all want to be enriched through this fellowship in the word. So um, this last week, let's see, we read through Genesis chapter 28 through Genesis 47, 27. So we covered a lot of ground. And so there's no way we can cover all of the things that are in these stories. Um, but as I was preparing, I just felt so drawn to the story of Joseph. Mm. Um, and he's, uh, Joseph's my dude. I, I love Joseph. There's about a hundred parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. Um, you know, he's a type of Messiah. There's so many lessons that his life and story contain. I won't be able to touch all of the content. I'm just going to lay out a few of the things that I felt the Holy Spirit stressed to me in, in preparation for tonight. Um, but it's a he, this story is a very rich, deep, wonderful. Uh, I mean, the Lord spends over 10 chapters developing this uh, in the Bible. And so very important story for, for us in the book of Genesis. And I love the story of Joseph. So just by way of summation, 
Uh, he is uh, born of Rachel. He's Jacob's favorite son. Uh, has a couple dreams. We know the story. Uh, he sees that his brothers and his actually his, his parents will bow down to him as well. Uh, his brothers resent him, sell him into slavery. They were going to kill him. Um, his older brothers intervene. He doesn't get slain, but he does get so, sold to some Ishmaelite traders who happen to be passing by the scene. Uh, so they sell Joseph off. He goes down to Egypt, gets sold into the captain of the guard's house, a man named Potiphar. Uh, the favor of the Lord is with Joseph. He's succeeding in everything he does. And he's promoted to second in command in Potiphar's house. Things are going pretty well. Potiphar trusts him with everything. And Potiphar's wife starts to uh, have eyes for Joseph. And she begins to pursue him for an uh, illicit relationship. Joseph actually is a man of honor and says, look, my master has entrusted everything to me. How could I do this evil before God uh, and, and sleep with you? you know? And so he tries to resist her. She eventually corners him. Uh, he runs away, leaves her cloak in, his, in her hands. She screams, basically gaslights uh, poor Joseph. You know, her, her false narrative becomes his reality. Uh, she brings this, the statement that, look, this Hebrew uh, slave tried to rape me, tried to overpower me. Here's his cloak to prove it. She creates a false narrative. And, and of course, Potiphar is furious and throws Joseph in prison. So things go for Joseph bad to worse. He's already been sold out by his family. Can you imagine the betrayal that Joseph feels? Now he's finally things are going a little bit okay in Potiphar's house. Bam, he this he gets gaslit, false narrative, thrown in prison, and now he's in a hellhole. I can't imagine what an ancient prison was like. Can't imagine it was very pleasant. Um, he rises again. God is with Joseph again. And he rises to second in command because he's so good at organizing administration. Uh, you know, a, a man's gift or a woman's gift makes room for them. And so the the, the captain of the prison uh, sees the anointed on Joseph's life, turns the running of the of the prison over to him. Um, you guys know the, the story. A couple of uh, men are thrown into prison, the, the chief cupbearer, the chief baker. They have dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams. They pass according to. Uh, the, the interpretation of the dream that the Lord gives Joseph, uh, the cupbearer is restored. The baker is executed. Joseph pleads, please remember me to Pharaoh because I'm in here. Uh, you know, I've been unjustly accused. A couple of years go by and Joseph is finally brought out when Pharaoh has a dream about the famine that's going to hit the land. Joseph is brought out and Finally, he's promoted to, again, second in command of the nation. So that's three times Joseph finds himself kind of uh, at the bottom of the heap. And then the Lord, through the Lord's maneuvering through his journey, promotes him to where he has authority. He's a leader. Um, and so he is positioned in uh, Egypt to have great influence um, as a leader in that government. Um, the strongest empire of the ancient world. And so that's all. I'm just laying the, 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 the context here for what the Lord laid in my heart. And tonight's kind of title uh, for this little homily is A Cup of Perspective in the Furnace of Affliction and Suffering. Um, suffering, this is one of the first, the first deep dives uh, into suffering that the Bible goes into great detail. Uh, innocent man. Everything's against him. He's betrayed, unjustly accused, punished for crimes he didn't commit. Um, the people that should have loved him rejected him. Um, the people that should have fought for him abandoned him. He's really having a, a hard time. And so the Lord is going to great lengths to lay out a story of, of pain and suffering. And, and really the lesson is going to be at the end of the story where, where Joseph says ultimately to his brothers, what, what you meant for evil. God uses has used for good. And that's such a key for us as believers is, you know, Jesus said in this life, you're going to have trouble. You're going to suffer. And he goes so far as to say, consider it all joy when people say false things about you for my name's sake. This isn't the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you'll have, your great will be your reward in the kingdom of heaven. 
when you suffer for my name's sake. And so we've got to count the cost as disciples. And this is one of those stories that in my life and in my journey, and I know in many of yours as well, you draw on um, where we eat that bread and say, okay, I'm going through some hard things. I need some encouragement. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to encourage us because the days are dark and there's division and strife. Uh, um, And if you've ever been through a betrayal, you can't go through a betrayal unless somebody's close to you and an ally that then turned on you. And uh, I've been through a couple and brothers and sisters, it's hard. We go through hard things as disciples. But the story of Joseph gives me hope. And I want to read this scripture as way of reflection. This is found in uh, Psalm 105. And uh, it's verses 16 through 19. And it says, uh, he called, God called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. And he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. The Lord tested Joseph's character. And that's the cup of perspective amidst the furnace of affliction and suffering. There are times in our lives like Joseph that are disorienting. We may struggle and not understand circumstances. Why is this happening to me? You know, Joseph, we know, is he's 30 years old. The Bible says exactly how old he is when he becomes second in command in Egypt in the story. But he was a, young, a much younger man, obviously, when he was sold into slavery. So they estimate he was 17 years old. So you're talking about maybe 13 years from the time he sold to the Ishmaelite traders to when he's finally promoted. That's a long time. He's married. He's got kids by the time the reunification with his family occurs. And he actually names his children, you know, son of my sorrow. And, you know, he's he's hurting. He's naming his children after his pain. Uh, And so what has happened to him has affected his very soul. And. But here this scripture in Psalm 105 says God's doing something. He's testing Joseph's character until the fullness of time came to uh, fulfill the prophecies about his life. And we got to understand is I know many of us have prophetic words and promises that God has spoken over our lives. You know, whether we're talking about we can look at David, you know, he's called to be king. He goes through a 20 year period before when he was when he was given that prophetic word about being a king to when he finally is king over all of Israel is about 20 years. Moses spends 40 years on the backside of a desert after he runs away from uh, Egypt for murdering a man. Um, God had God chills him out for 40 years on the backside of a desert. And so we have these long periods of time. We read about Abraham, you know, about 25 years ago from when Abraham is leaves Ur and he's, he's about 75, and he's 100 years old when Isaac is born. And so there's this testing that God requires of us, where are we going to wait? Do we have faith? But he's refining our character. It says specifically he's testing Joseph's character. And so, you know, as we go on this journey and we're reading through the Bible, part of what we want to do together is encourage each other and, and draw upon the truth that are there in the scriptures for us to glean. And so I don't know uh, all of you on the call tonight, but if we were to go out for coffee and I were to you know, say, hey, Cindy in Colorado, let's let's have a cup of coffee. Cindy, what's going on in your life? Uh, how are you doing? And you could unfold a, a tale just like Joseph, you know, or or Tina and Ryan. How are you guys holding up during the pandemic? And you could tell me some stories or or Deborah. You know, would you talk to me about what's going on in your family? And you could say, man, brother Jed, would you pray for me? Because I got some stuff that's hit the fan and I don't, I don't know a way out of this thing, but God, right. I'm in prison. My feet are bruised. I've got an iron collar around my neck. I didn't do it. I didn't sleep with that woman. I I was falsely accused and I was betrayed by my family, but God is doing something. And I think it's interesting in the story, it says God caused the famine. He caused a famine, but he sent a man ahead of it. Now, why? You know, 
God uses this adversity to move and move the people of God, Israel, down into Egypt. He's told Abraham they would be there for over 400 years. And so he is migrating a people down where he wants them to be, and he's using a famine to drive it. But he's got a, he's got a man of salvation in the mix. The whole world would, would have died. The ancient world would have gone under. But Joseph didn't just save Israel. He saved Egypt, and he saved the entire ancient Mediterranean basin. We don't know how many people that would have been, but through governmental authority and through an anointing that Joseph had as a gifted man, God was able to administrate salvation uh, in the physical world through his leadership. And so, but in order to get there, Joseph had to undergo some tremendous trials. And it, but his takeaway, what you meant for evil, God, God meant for good. And so whatever you're going through, I don't know what it is. But I do know this because the Lord taught me this. When I became a father, um, I learned my first, the first lesson I learned as a father was when my son was having a medical procedure done. So right when he was an infant and I didn't want to watch the procedure because he was in pain and he was squirming and struggling. And, and I just pulled away and the Lord spun me back around and just said, Jed, a father's always present with his children in their pain. That taught me so much about God's heart for all of us. You know, Joseph felt alone, but he was not alone. He wasn't alone in Potiphar's house. God, God's favor was with him. He wasn't alone in the prison. God's favor was with him. And he wasn't alone when he was abandoned by his family. God had a plan and he was going to reconcile them in the fullness of time. But it was 13 years. Um, and so as we're going through this, that's one of the beautiful things about this community and this bread for the journey. We're all pilgrims. We're all going through different things. Suffering is going to look different in each one of our stories, but beloved, all of us are going to have to go through suffering. And you know this, we know this. James 1, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, consider it all joy when you undergo fiery trials and, and challenges because it's refining your character and it's, it's creating perseverance and endurance. It's perfecting endurance. That's what God's after. He's, he wants us running a marathon. This Christian life is not a sprint. It's not a short jaunt. It's an eternal call. And as we walk through life, he wants us to have that mentality of a distance runner, the eye on the prize. In fact, that's what Paul says, right, to Timothy, run the race. you got to run the race marked out for you to win the prize. But man, it can be a challenge at times, but I love the story of Joseph because it brings hope and it reminds me a father's always present with his children in their pain. And though we can't see all ends and no, though we don't know the timing, he will bring good even out of evil. So there's a couple of perspectives in the midst of the furnace of affliction and suffering. And so here's some questions to kick off our discussion. Um, why is suffering, do you think, suffering a necessary ingredient in refining character. Why do you think suffering is a necessary ingredient in how God refines our character? We'd love to hear somebody's thoughts. Amen. Amen. I think, um, thank you, um, um, Pastor, uh, Pastor Jed. It's always a pleasure. Um, I remember following you on all your series on the table on YouTube. It was extremely insightful. I was I was I was tremendously blessed uh, by what I learned uh, um, when when it comes to uh, Christians relating with the Jews. Uh, it was a tremendous blessing. Uh, but with that said, um, suffering is such a necessary ingredient uh, because number one, we live in a fallen world, and in a world such as this, there is suffering. And if you're going to minister to those who are facing various pains, you have to be able to uh, relate with them on that level. Um, not only that, um, uh, we see that in the example of Jesus because he went through the same thing. And I remember scripture saying that he went through all the pain, like he, he, was, he, he was a man acquainted with much pain. Uh, the same pains that we are acquainted with today so that we could not have an excuse as to why we are falling or failing. 
or we are refusing to put our trust in Christ. Uh, so uh, number one is, 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 is being able to relate with those whom you're trying to win. If you're not able to relate with them, then you may not be able to com- be compassionate, uh, which is another, another good ingredient when it comes to being a, a follower of Christ or a, and a minister of, of the gospel or uh, an evangelist. You have to be able to understand who you're trying to win. And so that's why suffering is such a necessary ingredient in, in, um, in the faith. Uh, amen. Love it, Terrence. That was, thank you, brother. Great to hear your thoughts on that. And, you know, as you're sharing, I just was, was reminded of in Joseph's story, if you remember, he, he kind of punishes his brothers when they first come. He doesn't, you know, it's not all happy days right there in the beginning a little bit, doesn't reveal himself, but he waits until, if you remember, Judah is like, take me. He's willing to, he's willing to, he waits until Judah says, take me in prison. I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit for my brother. And that's what breaks Joseph's heart and sends him into, into tears. And it touches what you just said is that somehow Joseph's suffering had conditioned him. And when he saw Judah starting to suffer and hurting and like Judah had learned the lesson of like, you got to love your brother. You don't betray your brother. And Judah grew and, and it was like Joseph's compassion kicked in at that moment. And he realized now is that my heart to my brothers and, and, and he started to weep. So beautiful, Terrence, uh, any other thoughts there on why is suffering in, 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 such an important ingredient in refining our. Uh, Pastor Jed, uh, I honestly believe that the human body was designed in a way to kind of show us how spiritually things are. Uh, Things are constantly referred to us for our understanding, like God references living water and never thirsting again. And we're able to relate that to the spirit. I believe that same way as in the gym, without any opposition, you don't grow in strength. So I think that when we go through these times and everything is to strengthen us, to help us understand the situations, to give us, bring knowledge to these situations so that we can find spiritual answers in these to help others. Beautiful. Absolutely right. Without resistance, muscles don't get stronger. That's a great point. Thank you, Kyle. Hey, Jad, this is Scott. How are you? Hey, Scott. Great. How are you doing, brother? Good. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Well, I, and, and I think, you know, certainly over the last months, we've, we've certainly experienced some trials, but I think, um, you know, we see God's hand in it and I see, I see God's hand in it. But what I think is it is about reliance, that God wants us to be reliant on him. Uh, and that's kind of how I've been feeling for the last couple of months. And so that's uh, really what I wanted to say. Yeah. Amen. I, I want to tag on to the back of that because I, I'm thinking about something that maybe we don't, that doesn't come to mind when we first think of why would suffering, you know, be something that the Lord would use to refine us. But I also think it has to do with gratitude, um, you know, because just like we see as we kind of get through the story, we're going to find that this, uh, the Israelites who the Lord you know, he caused the famine, which caused them to go to Egypt. And he sent Joseph ahead, all of this because of his sovereignty over the situation. But we know that ultimately they became slaves in Egypt. And so God allowed them to go into slavery, which is extreme suffering for his people. And so, you know, we see that in part of his plan, um, it was to rescue them from slavery so that they would be grateful to him in this way that he was their deliverer, modeling something for the world to see, you know, um, that God is a rescuer, that he's a deliverer. And there's, you know, a heart of gratitude that we have also because we see in the New Testament, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. And sometimes we can be in the middle of these things and we don't see how we're possibly going to be delivered from it. And we may have to go through something for a long time, but if we can set our heart 
and our trust on him who said that he will deliver us from them all, knowing that he is good, then we can change our perspective about the situation. You know, believing his promises to be true changes the way we endure the trial. Because if we know he's going to, like as Romans 8, 28 says, work all things for the good mm. of love him and are called according to his purpose, then I know even if I'm going through something, he's allowed it in my life. Even if it's bad, he's allowed it. So there's some reason that I can't understand why he's allowed it, but I have to believe and know that he is good and that he watches over those who fear him. So I know he's watching over. I know I can lay my head on my pillow at night and be in perfect peace because he says he'll keep you in perfect peace who keeps their eyes fixed on him. You know, and so it's like through those situations, we start to even learn that these promises are true. You know, we go through, because really where it says, you know, that um, the Lord will be our strength, you know, or the joy of the Lord, you know, these things that we read about in scripture, sometimes it takes these trials to test our faith to see if it's actually genuine. And then, and then also to allow us to experience God in a way that becomes real to us, you know, because we begin to now believe God when we see that I really did have joy in the middle of this struggle when I couldn't imagine how it was possible. And, and my personal testimony, I lost my 18 year old daughter. Um, tragically, she passed away. And the day after she passed away, I can't even believe it even testifying of it, but it's true that I was on my knees in my kitchen floor with my hands in the air and tears rolling down my face. I was all alone in my house, but I was praising God. I was just, I was listening to a worship song, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And I remember just feeling, I couldn't um, fathom that I was able to feel such, such grief and such joy at the same time, you know, but it was the experience of that suffering that I was able to experience the truth of who God is, because he says he's close to the brokenhearted, you know, and I was so brokenhearted and that became real for me, but I wouldn't have known that scripture to be true, to be able to testify about it had I not experienced it. Wow. Krista, I mean, you're touching on so many beautiful truths in what you just shared. So I just want to honor you and thank you for sharing your heart. And you just talked about, about testimony. You know, God wants to go from being a, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and impersonal to being the God of Jed and Nicole. You know, my, yeah. he gives us these personal uh, experiences where he delivers us. You know, and testimony is a legal word where you go into court and you give testimony. You don't have to know everything, but you're just being required to tell what you know. What, it, what has God done for you personally? That's your testimony. And, and he, as he delivers you and as he walks you through pain and as you go through different trials, you're building this testimony, just like God, Abraham had stories and Isaac had stories and Jacob had stories. We all have stories that, that God makes it personal. But when you're suffering and you're crying out, like you said, and your heart's broken over pain and over loss and over grief, but then his, then then he becomes that much more real. And that testimony is just thick with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because no one can ever take that from you. The enemy can't take it. No one can touch it. When you experience something of God and it's real, the person with the experience is never at the mercy of the person that just has an opinion. And when you live it, faith and that's truth and that's, that's the testimony. Sylvia, were you about to say something? I absolutely, I was, and just wanted to agree with everything that has been said, but also agree that it is in the suffering where God truly shows that he is God, you know, and brings you to that point where he is so real that nothing and no one can take that away from you. It goes from being someone you read about in the pages of scripture to a life up close and personal. I came to know Christ 
and fell more in love with him because of the suffering that I was going through. Now, my loss was different from Krista's, but I remember when I was going through uh, the, the loss, my husband and I separated, he left, and my life changed radically. And I remember crying myself to sleep every night, and Jesus faithfully showed up. And when he says, blessed are those who mourn, because mourning comes in more than one shape, form, and fashion. He said, blessed are those who mourn, but they shall be comforted. He comforted me every single day until I got to that place where I didn't feel like my heart was going to burst and I was going to die. Amen. And for me, my response was, I remember at a point where I literally did not want to leave, live any longer. Satan told me every reason why I should commit suicide. Jesus told me every reason why I should live. And I'm so grateful and I am so thankful. And I will tell you that even being raised in a Christian home, I fell in love with him during my suffering. Amen. I would tell you that I loved him, but I'm telling my love that no one can take away from me that I am at that point in my life where I say, I love my children. I love my family. You can take everything, including my house and fall down on the ground. But if you leave me with Jesus, I know he's going to work it out and everything is going to be all right. And then the other thing I discovered is like with Joseph, Every suffering was preparing him for the next thing that was coming. Having been a woman who served in the army for all the years that I did, Joseph would not have made it if he'd have crumbled when he found himself in that pit that his brothers had thrown him into. It didn't have any water. If he'd have got in the Potiphar's house and compromised it with the wife, trying to, you know, seduce him and then even get in the jail, he didn't. God was preparing him to become second in command because he knew everything that he was going to face. You know, the scripture may not tell us about it, but it does give us a glimpse. And that is when the brothers come and they're eating with the Egyptians, it says Joseph ate alone. Why? Because he was offensive for the uh, Egyptians to eat with him. The Egyptians ate by themselves and then their brother. So what is God telling us? He wasn't well received. Amen. You've got this non-Egyptian now trying to tell us what to do. Come on now. The struggle is real. God was preparing him for what was coming. Amen. And every one of our struggles, that's why we need to be excited. I know it's difficult, but he knows what's coming because he knows the end from the beginning. And he's getting ready, getting you ready for what's coming next so you can stand and refuse to compromise. Amen. Oh, yeah. That, you know, what you're saying there, I just feel this is for, for somebody on the call that I'm about to share. It was for all of us, but maybe someone specifically. Um, preparation, you know, going back to the character being tested because of the prophetic word over Joseph's life. I'm reminded of a very particular verse in David's life. It's 2 Samuel 5, verse 12. And David has finally come into, it's 20 years now, where David's father-in-law, the king, king, has tried to kill him. He's lost his best friend. Uh, he's, his men have tried to kill him at different times. Like David has lost a wife that, that was his father gave, father-in-law gave her to another man. He's, he's been through some stuff, but God's preparing him to be a king. And this is, this is the verse, 2 Samuel 5, verse 12. A foreign king has now built David a palace, and David goes into his palace and realizes he's now the king. And the Bible says this, David realized he was blessed for the sake of Israel. David somehow emotionally in, in, entered in everything. I get it now. I had to run all over this country and learn all of the, all of the physical geography. I had to go through all the suffering I went through I, to prepare me, just like Sylvia said. Because, God, you want to love this people through me. It's not about me. David realized it's not about me. I'm blessed so that because God wants to love these people. Joseph, I think, recognized that because that's why he said, look, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Just like Psalm 105 said, God sent a man ahead of the famine. Joseph understood. 
I had to go through what I went through because God was positioning me as just a piece of, on the chessboard. You know, he's moving his, he's moving the pieces. And, and so he didn't ask my permission. He doesn't have to ask our permission. He, he is preparing us for what's coming and for the calling of our, on our lives. And so in your story, you know, for in King David's example, it was he was going to be the king of Israel for that period of time. But he knew he was blessed for the sake of Israel. Who, who are you blessed? I'm blessed for the sake of these people or that calling or this mission or whatever that is. As we're walking through this, you know, God has been preparing you for a ministry or for to be able to comfort somebody that's going through something that you've been through and you can comfort someone with the comfort you've been given. And so this move, just, just to transition to a, 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 the second question for us tonight. Um, you know, Joseph's character was the only one being refined in the story of Joseph, his brothers and his father were too. And as we think about that, I want us to think about Jacob here and Joseph and, and, and the brothers. You know, Jacob loved Joseph, and he thought he was dead for 13 years. And his sons lied to him. Like, if, as a dad, like, he is crying so loudly. I mean, he's, this is a broken man. Jacob's heart is broken. And, and God doesn't show up in a dream and tell him, hey, Jacob. Don't worry, Joseph's alive. God doesn't resolve it. So why is God allowing Jacob's heart to be broken this way? And what about the brothers? There, God's working on Joseph's kin in the midst of all this. So I'd love for us to maybe think about that and, and talk about that. What do you guys, what aspects of Jacob's character is God refining? What aspects of the rest of the family, do you think that God might be refining in the story? Um, so. For me with Jacob, I have always felt sorry for Esau. And, you know, because he stole his birthright. And I thought, here Esau is going out doing you know obeying his father and hunting and i know it was the will of the lord for jacob to receive it but in just human terms i always felt sorry for esau because i thought he was broken when he walked in and it's like oh your birthright's gone and so i don't know if this had something to do with jacob just receiving compassion for esau i don't know but um, that just came to mind. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, the Bible, one of the, one of the laws is reap what you sow. So, you know, Jacob sowed betrayal in his, to his brother. And here in Jacob's own family, brothers are betraying brothers. Um, is that, or are, are we seeing that because, to your point, Cindy, you know, Jacob made some decisions to, to, to hurt his brother uh, I don't know. I mean, that's all speculation um, and anecdotal, but I think that's something to definitely consider. Does anyone else have other thoughts? Is that maybe a generational sin that entered in there? And you have the tension with Isaac and Ishmael too, even before that. Um, well, when I think about... Um... Esau, um, I just think about the recklessness of uh, all the the uh, other 12 tribes of Israel. You know, um, you know, you are being promised a birthright and because of uh, hunger, you sell it. You know, um, th that's reckless uh, because it is true that line that God promises to, you know, uh, uh, build a nation for himself. And yet you, you decide to sell your birthright because of food. And um, so for me, just, just that character right there, it's, it's a bit reckless. Uh, just like uh, Joseph and his brothers were being reckless with, 
with with jo- not well well uh, the brothers were being reckless with Joseph by right? just taking him and throwing him and selling him, you know, um, uh, not knowing what God had planned through Joseph. Uh, same thing as uh, Jacob, uh, um, uh, Jacob, not um, Esau, not knowing what God was planning would just be reckless with God's plans like that. That's why I think God really didn't hold him in high regards. Rather, he did uh, for um, uh, Jacob because he was a man who who didn't who who wasn't as built as 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 Jacob was, but very smart and and knew how to get his way around. You know, so. Um, so that's just what I think of of, uh, of Jacob, just an attitude of uh, recklessness, uh, per se. So, Jed, can I chime in on something when you were um, talking about God refining not just uh, Joseph, but also uh, Jacob and the rest of the family members? I want to chime in on Judah in particular and really, really take a look at what God did and how we can see God's wonderful plan of redemption. When we go back into them being uh, him, Joseph being sold into slavery, we know that all of the brothers schemed and decided they were going to do it. The Bible clearly tells us, though, that Reuben tried to intervene, and he was the one who came up with the idea of put him in the pit, but the Bible says that he was going to come back and get him and then return turn him back to his father. But then it highlights this. And now think about Judah. And we know that that is the very lineage that Christ himself came through. I love God's plan of redemption and how he gives us an opportunity to get it right when we mess things up. The Bible tells us that Judah is the one who said, what would it profit us for him to stay in this pit? And he saw the Ishmaelites, some versions say the Midianites, coming, let's sell him so at least we can get something out of the deal, you know, get something for ourselves. And so they agree and they do that. Reuben comes back, he's been, he's gone, he's upset, all of that. Fast forward. Reuben is the first one that tells his father, Jacob, let the boy go with me. And if... I don't deliver him back to you. You can have my son. All that. Mm-mm. Jacob is saying, Mm-mm, no, I already saw what you did with one of my concubines. I don't have any faith in you not going down that road with you, brother man. Sorry. But Judah comes, says pretty much identically the same thing. What happens? He said, okay, you go ahead. You take him. You take. See, that's God. God knew who had really been the one that came up with the scheme. But God said, I'm going to go ahead and test you on this because you've gone through some things, you know, lost a wife, had some things going on, some sons. You're probably ready now to step into your maturity because suffering causes us to grow. And now I'm going to test you on it because in Job, he says that he visits us daily. He visits man and he daily, he tests us moment by moment. Every moment we're being tested. What happens is they go, you know, Joseph comes up with his scheme because as you said earlier, Jed, it's not nice to them right now. I'm not liking you too much. I might have to cover and conceal, but I'm going to throw some challenges your way because I remember what you did to me. Then he schemes because he wants Benjamin. Look, I don't care about you other 10, but if I can get Benjamin down here in Egypt with me, I'm going to be all right. Maybe I'll figure out daddy later on. Bottom line is up front. Benjamin is going to be taken. Judah remembers because a transformation is taking place. Uh -uh. I can't let this happen again. Surely God, from the moment they got there, they begin to say, God is trying to get us for what we did earlier. Uh -uh. I made a promise to dad. I need to become a man of integrity and the man of my word. So therefore he goes and then he tells Joseph all that he did. Mm -mm. I told dad this. How can I go back without him? Take me, take me. Causes Joseph to break. But also what God wants us to see is that's the transformation of Judah. And in the, re- in the end result is he's going to end up with the greatest blessing of all of the sons 
because Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, comes through his lineage. God's plan of redemption is absolutely amazing. It doesn't matter where you've been. It matters where you end up. God Come is on. God, and he is great. Ooh, love it. Amen. It's so good. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, Joseph, if you remember, when he sends him back up to get daddy, he tells him, hey, don't quarrel about this on your way home. I think there's a beautiful lesson there. I mean, he knew this was going to be hard for everybody on the way home. They're going to be talking and he's preparing them uh, that this is God's not it's not he's he's making sure they're not going to be any further divided than they've already been. Um, and so he's going ahead of them for that. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for that. Um, any other thoughts on, on that question about how God's refining uh, the brothers and Jacob's heart in the midst of this story? Oh, come on, somebody. I know you got something to say. Let's do it. We're in this together. Well, I'm, I would say that the Lord is showing the brothers that there's nothing hidden from his sight. Like they, they, they wanted to do everything underhanded, not tell anybody, secretive. But you know, the Lord reveals it all, and the Lord says that um, that there's no that there's nothing that His eyes don't see. So I, I think that that's part of the refining of the brothers as well. Uh, my take on it would be going back to the father, his mourning of all those years of losing his son. The brothers had to endure their father's heart breaking all those years. And uh, I believe that that might have been his suffering that shaped others. So God used their father suffering to soften their hearts so that when they were presented with that, that test again, they would do anything to avoid going through that suffering again, preparing them for that moment. We haven't gotten to that, to the chapter. I love Genesis 49. We're going to get to it this week where Jacob has become Israel fully. His transformation is complete and he worships God, bows on his, bows his head on his staff. He's got, his sons, grand, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren around him, and he's speaking blessings over the tribes. And what a powerful transformation that this man whose heart's been broken, and he's, but he loves his people so much, and, and he's speaking blessings to, and, and addressing issues in his family, and what we can talk about that as we hit, hit those chapters, but it's so good, Kyle. Yeah, I think everybody was transformed through this family drama and trauma. Uh, Stacy, did you want to uh, have something to say there? Yeah, I was um, going to share that. I think, too, it reminds me, I, you know, the brothers at one point say, um, you know, Joseph wants to uh, enslave us. He wants to sell us into slavery, which is interesting because there's some projection going on there. But I think, too, it's almost like the way God allowed it all to unfold it's almost like he wants them to come to confession themselves, you know, like he wants them. Like, and they even say, like, all this is happening to us because of what we did to our brother Joseph. So they are feeling that conviction. Um, they still have not confessed to their father, though. They've not really confessed to God. Um, just like when God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden, he came looking. And he says, what did you do? The same thing with David. You know, God waited a, a while, at least a year, um, and was waiting for him to kind of come to confession himself, you know, and then even James tells us to confess our, our faults one to another that we may be healed, you know, so I think even though they were going on in their life, there was still a lot of brokenness because they hadn't come to confession. And then when Joseph reveals and all that is unfolded and they weep together, there is this reconciliation, um, you know, that needed to happen. But I think we can take that into our own lives too about, um, I think God even allowed a lot of time. Of course he allowed all this 
to unfold, you know, for the long purposes, like what was already said about bringing them to Egypt and God's big plan. But I think a lot of that too is like when you live with something like that, that you've done day in and day out for that long, you know, what does that do to a man's soul? Do you know what I mean? Um, so obviously, but I mean, it was starring cause like you said, he finally, um, comes to a place like Judah is willing to sacrifice. He knows what he's done is wrong, you know? Um, but they still had not really told their father what they had done. Yeah. That, that and they really, be- we don't see where they had confessed before God either. Do you know what I mean? Like David, when he's confronted, he's yes, I am the man. I did it. You know, he immediately goes into, you know, repentance. So I'm just saying for me, that's something that's kind of, I think, significant is that God does come. He comes looking. He comes looking and he wants us to repent. Amen. That's really great insight, Stacey. I uh, appreciate that perspective. And we're coming up on, uh, you know, the official time where we'll kind of dismiss. But if we want to, people want to stick on till about nine, I know there'll be a number of us that will be on here. But I did want to finish with, with one thought. Um, you know, the Bible's alive, living word, and it's prophetic. And, and in the story of Joseph, I just want to make a quick parallel because I think it's relevant to our day, actually. You know, just like Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and they didn't see him, you know, they didn't, they didn't love him. You know, Jesus was rejected and betrayed by, uh, by Israel. He was sent to his own. His own received him not. But that's not where the story ends. You know, he, he comes back. God comes back around with Israel. And Jesus is the greater Joseph. And I love uh, talking to my Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters uh, that have come into the family, that, are, that, that love the Messiah. And, you know, as just like Joseph has this moment, remember when he re- finally reveals himself to the tribes of Israel, he kicks all the Egyptians out of the room. He says, everybody else, get out of the room. I'm going to have a little family moment here. And he reveals himself because he looked at Gentile. They, the Jewish people thought Joseph was a Gentile because he looked Egyptian. So he takes off his makeup and his headband or whatever he's wearing. And it's me. It's, it's your brother. It's Joseph. And this, in my opinion, is, you know, Zechariah chapter 12 says that Israel, a, a spirit of grace and supplication and prayer, be pulled out, poured out in the house of Israel and they will weep for the one whom they pierce their only son. And so just like the, the brothers wept with Joseph and he was weeping with them and there was this reconciliation, there's a great reconciliation coming today in the house of Israel where Jesus, the greater Joseph, who's gone ahead of us to prepare a way so that we could have life and live as a family. Uh, he was betrayed. and He was put in prison and his, his, he was bruised for us. He's revealing himself to the Jewish people, and there's a reconciliation occurring, uh, and and there's weeping on each other's necks, and and uh, it's just a beautiful story what's unfolding. And so as we again drink that cup of perspective as we go through suffering and connect with Jesus's suffering for what he he went through for us, but it was for the joy set before him he endured what he endured because he saw a day coming when every tribe and tongue would be united in our faith in him and the Jewish people would be restored to the Messiah and to the father. Amen. And so I'm going to say a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. And if you'd like to stick on and just continue to chat away, you're more than welcome to. We'll keep the line up until about nine. So heavenly father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for this amazing story. Uh, As we pulled out the microscope a little bit and looked at Joseph and his family and Uh, just all the things we've talked about tonight, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would water the seed of your word in our lives, that the things that are for each one of us, you would grow, that we would become, as your word says, conformed or to the image of Messiah and not uh, transformed to what, to the way the world looks, Lord, but our minds will be renewed that we could think like you and act like you and speak like you and love like you. And so I thank you for my brothers and sisters on the call and their families and just the the different ministries represented. Pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, you would bless, uphold, keep, and guide with your wisdom 
uh, everybody represented. And just thank you for this venue where we could come together and celebrate your word and read your word and be changed by your word. We give you all the thanks, all the glory, all the praise in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you guys. And uh, if you got to jump off, lots of love. And if you need to stick on for a little bit, uh, we do. Oh, I, I do need to mention um, there are breadcrumb videos every day. They're little daily little nuggets from facilitators that will just be, hey, this is what we feel the Holy Spirit saying on our daily reading. Um, check those out on the website. There's also a page that we're gonna we're gonna create. I think Krista's uh, said that she's gonna try and get it up today or tomorrow. That it would just be if you have questions yourself that we didn't touch on tonight, uh, that you're like, hey, what about this in Joseph's life? Or you want to you didn't get it out. We didn't have enough time. Go ahead and, and, and you can put that on this page that will be linked on the website and you can ask your questions and we'll, we will have a little bit of time uh, where we may revisit a few things um, to kind of wrap up any loose ends from previous conversations on next as we meet together next week on Monday. So. Um, thank you guys for jumping on and sharing your hearts. This is awesome. Well, as we continue, I wanted to just also mention, you know, that tagging on to your last point about basically what I heard and what you were saying is that Jesus was, you know, um, a type and a shadow is what we see in Joseph's life, you know, because there's really nothing that's said in the Bible about Joseph being bad. There's nothing uh, not any words of criticism about his character. You know, um, he he really seemed to be very concerned with helping other people. You know, we see he was a comfort to the cupbearer, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's cupbearer and the baker. Um, and Joseph didn't seem to also be, uh, he didn't seem changed by either humiliation or honor. He We see integrity in Joseph, and he's the only one in the Bible that's presented that way. And so I think that's really important for us to take note of that because he was a foreshadowing in a sense. And like Joseph's situation, you know, as you pointed out, Jed, God's own son would be rejected. So here's the parallel by his brethren and taken away um, all the way down to utter humiliation, you know, like Joseph, and then raised to be savior because Joseph became a type of savior to the people by storing up all the food and having the foresight that was given to him by God to save people from the famine. So he is that. The reason I think this is important for us to, to meditate upon here is that, remember, Jesus said um, to search the scriptures for they, they bear witness of me. And he was referring to the Old Testament. So we read the Old Testament and we should be looking for Jesus as we're reading because he's saying these bear witness of me. And, you know, it was his, we're looking for his likeness in these stories for his um, shadow because Jesus himself is the substance, but the shadow falls all the way across the pages of the Old Testament and especially in Genesis. So good. Yeah. When you think about that, you know, it happens several times, you know, Joseph has a calling from God and we'd like to think that everyone's going to celebrate our call. Hey, I got this dream. Uh, <laughs> nope. Uh, same thing happened with David, right? David, you're the Samuel's like, wait, there's got to be another son. Like none of these, none of these guys are the one. Jesse, is there anybody else in your family? Oh yeah, but he's worthless. You know, he's out on the on the sheep hill, and his brothers, David's brother, said the same thing. Like, you're, who who do you think you are, right? And then Jesus himself, his own family, they didn't believe him. In fact, at one point, they think he's crazy. His, his own brothers, you know, and so as we have our, our callings, you know, we want to think that people are going to celebrate and cheer. Sometimes that may be true, and I hope it is, but oftentimes we are, we're, we're resisted or the call of God is opposed by people around us and they don't understand and they don't see yet what God is doing in its fullness. And yet in fullness of time, God brings things around too. And so, you know, to your point, I just was thinking about these other stories, Krista, like how, you know, Jesus, you know, he's rejected by his family. David's rejected by his family. Joseph was rejected by his family. Um, And there's this pressure that sometimes those that are called by God have to kind of work through as the, as the calling manifests. Mm. Amen.
Well, you can even add Moses to that because uh, Aaron and uh, Miriam were not impressed with Moses' ability either. It's like, is he the only one that God talks to? Doesn't he talk to us too? Yeah, you call him whatever you want to, but aren't we a prophet and a prophetess too? So there is, uh, and, and I believe and know that that goes along with, that's part of the struggle. It's part of the testing. It's part of the growth. Uh, so that if you can make it and go through the opposition of those that you love the most, mm -hmm. then it should become a lot easier for those that are going to oppose you that are not directly connected to you. And what I love about Joseph as well is that he never tried to defend himself. So that too is an example of Christ. Christ could have easily defended himself against every accuser. But as the scripture says, when he stood before Pilate, he uttered not a word. Joseph never, at least the scripture doesn't show, that when his uh, Potiphar's wife lied on him, he didn't tell him, oh, wait a minute, man, let me tell you about your wife. Because you really need to know what's going on. He didn't. And even when, you know, the butler forgot him and the scripture says two more years went by before he remembered. And the only reason why I remembered is because God is the one that orchestrated, engineered the dream that no one else could answer but Joseph. Then the butler said, oh, I remember I've done wrong. But he didn't come in and say, look. You left me here, even when he became second in command, at least in the scripture. And I believe that's because it didn't happen. He did not treat him any differently because of the oversight. And he had an extended amount of time, two extra years that he stayed in jail. Why? Because I believe that like Christ, Joseph understood the kingdom perspective. And in understanding the kingdom, he understood First and foremost, God is sovereign. God is in control. And then whatever God chooses to do with those that are his, only God has a right to choose. And our steps are ordered. They're ordered by the Lord. He does all things well, and he has never, ever, ever made a mistake. And he won't start with you and I either. It's such a good point, Sylvia. It makes me reminds me of Ezekiel when, when God says to his the prophet, I'm sending you to a people, you, you know their language, they're not going to receive you. But see, I've made your forehead stronger than theirs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting dynamic of like how do you how do you develop a forehead like Flint? And well, I imagine in Ezekiel's life, he's been rejected a lot to prepare him to be the plow that he needs to be to push through some stubborn resistors in, in the hearts of the people that God sent him to message. You know, it's the same thing with a boxer. How do you learn to take a punch? Well, you get punched a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you have a glass jaw, the only way to get out of having a glass jaw is to learn how to take a punch. Mm. And, you know, it, it, you served in the military and I, you know, I don't want to speak out of school, but I imagine battle calm can only come when you have been under fire enough and you can actually function you're not in shell shock because you've experienced warfare and you can you you've understood how to operate under fire whereas someone who's never been under fire is going to more than likely can panic um and so these are ways that god i think builds those muscles in us to prepare us like you said sylvia if the closest people wound you and reject you you're going to you're going to have a callus so that it, it doesn't really hurt when someone you don't really know resists you mm -hmm. Well, Amen. another side of that, I think that can sometimes be a little bit of a challenging thought is when Jesus says, um, you know, that he didn't come to bring peace for the sword, you know, to divide members of households. And essentially, you know, we can get stuck there because sometimes because it's the thought of, well, that sounds op like to, in total opposition to who we believe Jesus to be. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, what do you mean you didn't come to bring peace but a sword? Because he is, after all, the prince of peace. But, you know, in that scripture, he's saying not you can't set anyone up 
higher than he he is that you can't choose your family over Jesus you can't choose anything or anyone over Jesus that's the you know he's saying draw the line in the sand you know I didn't come to bring peace or a sword if you have to choose me or them you choose me you know and so even though we might face opposition we still have to stand firm on the word you know and and stand on the truth of the word that we, um, you know, have to continue to follow the Lord, regardless of the opposition. Because sometimes, like you said, if you're not battle ready, you can compromise. And it really can, we can be easily, um, you know, the flesh is prone to wander, you know, so if we're not sure, if we haven't decided, I am going to follow Jesus, regardless of how uncomfortable that might make other people in my family, or, you know, things that I'm going to have to let go of. It it really, it all, it's all part of the process that we've got to decide that we're going to do it without compromise. Other thoughts out there tonight? Yeah, I would like to share. Go ahead, Terrence. Oh, I would like to share something that I, I gleaned from, um, from today's Bible study um, with the story of, you know, Joseph and his brothers. It's amazing how when God brought them together, he brought them together in a perfect instance, you know, the perfect setting. They were both humbled by their experiences. You know, uh, Joseph was well in the position to really retaliate from what their brothers did to him. But through the experience that he went through, he was humbled by that process. And the brothers uh, um, who had, you know, sold sold Joseph to slavery, uh, God humbled them through that plague, through the drought uh, that they, they faced for seven years, I believe. So it's just amazing how God created the perfect instance so that they could meet. And, 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 and I could just imagine um, them seeing Joseph's, Joseph's dream come true uh, uh, with them bowing down before him, you know, after he had told them several times, it, you know, several dreams to allude to that, you know, and, and, and to me, I, I kind of believe that that really uh, um, solidified their faith in what God was doing in all of this situation, you know, and, and, and I think that really speaks to us a lot, you know, when, when we go through various trials, um, and at the end, when we see that it worked out for our good, I think it's a good place for us to do, to reflect the genesis of our pain or suffering to see God's hand throughout every step till the point where God showed himself to be God, you know? And um, I think this is what really happened here. And I think that's something we can, we can, um, you know, as children of God, knowing the God that we serve, that when we go through trials and tribulations, like Joseph did, may we always remember that God's hand is in it. And when he gets us out of the fiery trial, amen, we should always remember that. You know, um, he is God, he's able, and he will see us through the end. Amen. 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 Um, bless the Lord. You know, as you know, that young um, man said, um, you know, when we go through trial and temptation, you know, we must always have faith in God. Because, you know, um, I have a son that uh, when I migrate here, I left back home in Jamaica and he was doing his master's, you know, graduate from university and was doing his master's. And it so happened that he went in depression. And then when we went home back to Jamaica and um, bring him home, 2020, um, 2020, um, 2019, yeah. And, you know, he's still at home and um, I cried. I cried and I asked God why. And you know, but you know, you know, nothing beat prior. And sometimes it's just shows, you no, know, we have to have faith in him. And just a couple um days ago, my had a son, he's working at the bank, and he said to me that um, mommy, I'm going to um resign. I said, why you never um Tell us before you um you're you're going to resign. Before you said he he gave them two week notice, and I get I started to get nervous, and I said and I said God, you know you gave this the the the, the, the um the, the the hardest battle to the strongest soldier to fight, and I started to pray, 
And I started to ask God, God, you know the reason why, you know? And I said, I leave everything in your hands. You understand? So these are the times that sometimes when we see that like, there's no way out, you know, everything's a process. And we know in life we have to have faith, you know, just faith in him and never give up. No matter what, I told my kids, them, listen, once you're in this world, there's always be um, temptation, trial, persecution, everything. But just pray and never let go because God never let go after us. No matter all this, this struggle, the struggle we are going through, you understand, the situation, sickness. You know, when I look back and I see what's going on in this world now with this disease, and I said to myself, only God alone, God alone can take us through, you know. So, you know, this is the thing that we have to hold on to him because he's the only way, the truth. You understand? So we have to just keep on trusting him and hold on and never give up and be our brothers and our sister, sister's keeper. You know, that, that's my few words. Amen. Amen. Deidre, I think you were trying to say something. <clears throat> I was. I don't even know if I could piece it together now, um, but I'm going to try. Um, it was it was going back to what Krista had said and then kind of into Terrence. And I, I can't even really kind of remember. But the point of it that I'm trying to get to is that even when Esau gave up his birthright for the cup of stew, porridge, however, food, it's, it's all in not just the food, it was the appetite. It's the, it's the longing for or the desire for things different from what God has for us. And I think it's kind of along the lines of what everybody is talking about because we all have it. You know, um, the Bible tells us that we're drawn away by our own lust or our own desire. And sometimes we have that desire to worry or to fret because, you know, like Jared or Krista was saying, that family members don't want to get with us or they don't want to see our vision. Thank you, Holy Spirit. They don't want to see our vision or the dream that God gave us. And then sometimes we're drawn away by becoming despondent or in despair or wanting people to accept us. So then we become man pleasers instead of God pleasers. You know, it's still a drawing away. It's still selling your birthright. And so it's not just food that, you know, it's, it's the example of how all of us can be drawn away by a desire. It could be a desire to be accepted by a particular group of people. You know, it could be a desire to be accepted by the religious group of people, you know, but so then I don't want to go against what they're saying, or I don't want to go against it, but I know what God is telling me to do, or I know what God is telling me to say. So all of us have that desire. And, and just to go back to what uh, Pastor Jed has said, how were they being refined, you know, even with Jacob, he was drawn away by his own lust and desire for, for more and tricking people and being a trickster, you know, and then getting all the way up to Joseph. Joseph had that same opportunity to be led away by his own desire to be bitter or to be unforgiving um, and, and really kind of go along with that. And then he refused to allow his appetite, his heart that is deceitfully wicked and cannot be trusted to lead him. But then he was led by God and then sit and knew that he could not not forgive them. I know I said a not and a not, but uh, that he could not go on with being bitter or angry or upset or resentful towards them. So I think even as we're all growing, there's great example, even through Esau, that um, we've got to be careful of that lust or that desire. Even if it's a desire to be angry with someone, the Bible says you can get angry, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And don't let that desire to sell your birthright or your blessing or your connection with God over just being angry about something or still upset uh, with someone or still bitter. And so that's still selling our birthright, our connection, our fellowship with the father over our personal um, 
emotions or our personal thought process of why somebody did what they did or why won't my sister get with me or why won't my brother support me or why won't these people come and be a part of what I'm doing and then we kind of get well if they're not going to do what I what I support what I'm doing so now when they have something I'm not going to support what they're doing and now you're falling into selling your birthright for your own emotion or your own feeling or your own appetite so I just wanted to share that Really good points. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying. And, you know, the longings, God put eternity in our hearts. And uh, desire and longing are part of the human experience. But sometimes we can locate our longings in temporal. We try to fulfill an eternal longing in a temporal wineskin. And I remember. You know, when you were sharing, Deidre, it, it reminded the Lord reminded me I was grieving a season in my life where I used to live in England and it was amazing. Uh, we lived there three years, and, and and what God did was phenomenal. And and I was I was really struggling with some stuff that had gone on uh, since, and was hurting. And I remember I was in my car, and the Lord just asked me a question: Do you know why this is so hard for you, Jen? And I, you know, when the Lord asks you a question he's the one that's got the answer. You know, he's the wonderful counselor. He saved me a lot of therapy, put it that way. I just said, Lord, I don't, I don't know. Help me. And I felt him just whisper in my heart. You've been looking for home your whole life. And England, that season in England was the closest you ever had it, but never mistake the cup of blessing that I give you. That's real. Don't mistake the cup for the ocean that exists in eternity. And that really taught me a lesson. I think what you're saying, Dietrich, like we can lose our vision so quickly. We God has it has the we, our longings are for Him. He's my home, not some place on earth. But I, the longing that's in me is for Him. And if I if I put those expectations on other people, I'll always be let down and be disappointed. We have to locate those eternal longings only in eternity. And that's that's the lesson is that the birthright he traded a temp, he traded something eternal for a, a morsel of food that's very temporal, um, and so it's a it's a lack of vision it's a lack of understanding the the longings in our hearts and I think how many dis, how much angst exists in the body of Christ over you know people are are longing and hoping and expecting things that are really good and God's got them for them but it's not in this life it's going to be in the one to come. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. In his time, he does all things well. Well, amen. Absolutely. And I just want to add on to uh, that in that note that when we remember that he does all things well, and yes, there is a longing and a desire in our hearts, and we can all fall susceptible to that. But Joseph held firm. And I just wonder, you know, perhaps at some point as the years went by, 13 or so, he forgot to remember the dreams. He held on to God, but God was a lesson in his heart for his life because he didn't see the fulfillment of those dreams, perhaps like he thought they were going to come. And even when he thought they would come, But at God's appointed time and God's appointed season, I don't think he woke up that morning saying, my brothers are going to be in line with all the other people I am here to serve to get some food to provide them with seed or whatever he was doling out on that day. He didn't. But suddenly and immediately at God's appointed time, he looked out and he saw them and they didn't recognize him. But what was their response? They begin to bow. I know that he had to remember those dreams and went and said, God, you again are demonstrating that no matter how long it may appear to me, how long it may take in the equation or the life of man, because we can say how long I've been praying for 25 years, God, and you still haven't answered 30 years. And it's still, mm -mm. at God's appointed time, The vision that he showed us 
what came from him will come to pass. Now, I'm not talking about some of that false stuff now, because we got a whole bunch of people talking and everything they're saying is not from God. But truly, the prophetic words, the dreams, the visions that come from God and not from man's vain imagination, no matter what. God will bring them to pass. And that is why he tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. So I would challenge us just like Hebrews 11, 21 and 22, that specifically addresses both Israel and Joseph. They held on to their faith. Israel in knowing Joseph, when I die, take me back to the promised land. And Joseph, when I die, please make sure that you take my bones. It is all equating to simply let's have more faith than desire and more faith and trust than anything else. Because he is God. He is God and he'll do it. Amen. He says, vengeance is mine. You know, we have a choice when people mistreat us and betray. And I heard a, this is from Robert Morris. I heard him preach a message about bitterness. And he said, I'll never forget it. So the last temptation of Christ was when they dipped a sponge in bitter wine and they pressed it up to his lips because he said he was thirsty and Jesus didn't drink it. He said, you can't stop the enemy from putting something bitter on your lips, but you can choose whether you drink it down or not. And that little nugget of you know, we have a choice when we're mistreated and betrayed and wounded and rejected. It may not be in this life, but faith, like you said, Sylvia, mm -hmm. if it's in this life and he and the moment comes and the restoration occurs, reconciliation occurs, great. It may be in the life to come when God wipes away every tear, mm -hmm. any wrong, and, and he writes every wrong, and your reward is with him. He said, consider it all joy when people say false things about you. There's going to come a day when they when they kick you out of the synagogue and they claim they're doing God a service. Mm. You know, that's the days that we're living in is people say, you know, you know, I'm doing it. God's telling me to hate you and reject you and, and divide. And all this stuff that's going on where evil is proclaimed as good and good is proclaimed as evil. Um, people's lives get chewed up. And as Krista said earlier, Jesus came to bring a sword. There's a division. It's it's not up for debate. He's not asking for our vote. Amen. He's not asking for our permission. He's a king. His kingdom is coming. And it's not a question of whether he's on my side. It's a question of, Jed, are you on his side? Get behind him. <laughs> Get behind Jesus and follow him and trust him that he'll make everything right in time, even if that means it's in the, in the life to come. Amen. 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 Well, I think with that, we're at the top of the hour here about to close out our meeting tonight. Um, I do pray that all of you have been blessed and just want to pray, Father, that you will bless the saints that mm -hmm. gathered in this place, Lord, that you will cause your face to shine upon them, Lord, that you would protect them as the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear you. Father, we pray that you'll smile upon them and be gracious to them for coming, Father, and that you will show your favor and give your peace upon your people as they go out of this place and watch over them, Lord, and uh, help this word that has been stirred in all of our hearts, Father, to take root and to produce much fruit for the kingdom. Lord, help us to be led by your spirit and to give us understanding, Lord, of these things that we've talked about, Father, so that we will have application in our lives for this word, that it will become who we are, that we can embody the scriptures. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, shalom. Good night. Shalom. And goodbye. Shalom. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>